Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Rise Sports. My name is Ryan Sullivan. Yes, we're working from the office today. Uh, Jay Demerit unfortunately could not join us. He'll be checking back in next week. On today's show, an incredible guest, just such an amazing figure in, in all of womankind, uh, especially in female sports. Catherine Switzer, uh, you'll know her from the uh, infamous, the famous, if you will, 1967 Boston Marathon incident. We're going to get into all of that. Uh, she's just such a tremendous guest. Uh, but first, my connection to Catherine Switzer, we actually ran a marathon together. I was in Kenya 10 years ago. This is the most random story ever. I was not going to run this half marathon. It's called the Safari Com uh, Marathon, and it's one of the top 10 hardest marathons to do in the world. And I had a few drinks the night before. The people I was with were like, hey, you got to run this or you're going to regret it for the rest of your life. And uh, so I hopped out onto the red dirt and a pair of shoes that I just... Uh, somebody gave me that morning, and I put up the absolute worst possible time in a half marathon. Uh, but I completed my first half marathon. It was in Kenya, no less. And Catherine Switzer, the first lady of marathon running, uh, was part of it. It's just uh, an incredible thing, an incredible connection to have. And now, without further ado, let's get to our guest. Very excited to welcome to the show uh, marathoner, champion runner she's absolutely done it all such a public figure for women in sports ladies and gentlemen Catherine switzer welcome to the show my friend welcome to rise sports thank you so much ryan it's great to be here yeah it's great to have you now now before we before we dive into it this is one of the greatest stories um that i have going uh, i got a few decent stories but this is definitely high, ranking high up there uh we ran a race together which is the most random thing ever because we were just chatting um, you know, off uh, off the show here, and you were mentioning that you just decided to run one race in Kenya, and it just so happened to be uh, the race that we we ran together, which is amazing. Well, I had put running on the back burner uh, for because of my career and and everything after nineteen. If you can imagine this, after nineteen seventy six, after my last Boston Marathon, I, I had some injury problems and I had a career opportunity. And I said, you know, it's a good time to hang up my shoes as a competitive runner, but never as a runner. So I always was jogging. I entered races and all that kind of stuff. But then long about 2009, I started thinking of making a comeback and um, working up to a marathon distance. I especially wanted to run the 2010 Athens Marathon. And uh, on the on the way, uh, was this opportunity to go to Kenya with Marathon Tours. And I said, you know what? It's my husband's 70th birthday. Let's treat ourselves to going. And I'll jog, jog through the half marathon because the first half marathon I've run in a long time. And what an experience it was. Well, as it turns out, it was your first race. <laughs> Tell us about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I. Uh, so I had absolutely no intention of running this thing, the uh, marathon tours, as you mentioned, giving them some great plugs here, uh, well deserved. They uh, they had this tremendous itinerary. Where you go, you travel through the country, and then the pinnacle of the trip is you run this Safari Com marathon, which is uh, one of the top ten hardest marathons uh, to complete in the world. And I, I completed the half marathon, mind you, but nonetheless, um, and it was just a life changing experience. There's there, you know, there's like armed rangers out there in, in case a, an animal gets at you but like you are running through the wilderness like there there's lions out there there there's there's rhinos there's zebras um just an, an amazing experience and uh and to top it all off i can say that i did it and Catherine switzer also ran the same race that is a total feather in the cap um so uh such a cool story but anyhow let's let's get to your story in particular um people see me on the show all the time so let's let's talk you here Catherine. um let's 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 go back to um to before everything before before all of the stuff uh went down at the boston marathon and and just let's let's talk about your love for the sport in general how it how it was born how it grew and uh, your support system on the way up you know my my love for running began when i was 12 years old and it and began um as an insecure little kid who was going to go off to high school the next year i mean a year early but you know i was going to be surrounded by 18 year olds and stuff and i was really very nervous and i think my parents could see that um and our school had something new that year which was called a girls field hockey team how lucky we were i mean we're talking like late 50s here okay um in fact i think it was 1959 and um we had a team we had a girls team which is amazing my father said if i would run a mile a day i'd make that field hockey team 
So my father said, if you would run a mile a day, you'd be the best player on that team. He was really motivational. And um, he, he, he knew I probably could make the team if I ran a mile a day. So I ran a mile a day. I got in very good condition. I did make the team and I really was one of the best players. But the amazing thing that happened, as much as I love field hockey, basketball, lacrosse, and all the sports I eventually played, it was the mile a day, which eventually became three, six, ten, um, that gave me this sense of empowerment for my whole life. Honestly, you know, here I am 72 years of age and that love of running is still there. The magic and the sense of power and fearlessness that the run gives me. Um, and it's also skipping way ahead in this story, but it's one reason why in Canada and the United States, the majority of the participating runners out there now are women. In the United States, the status 58% of all the participating runners are women. And and that that is a, a social revolution that is brought on by that sense of empowerment. But for me, it began at 12 and it's never, never left me. A day, a day that I run is a day that I have the magic. It's always true. That's fantastic. Now, on 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 your way up, let's let's say en route to uh, to the big marathon in, in 1967. There, uh, you you uh, run running for especially like in an organized event uh, for for women. It was just it it wasn't done. It it just it wasn't allowed on so many levels. And can you kind of describe sort of that um, the kind of the atmosphere that that you faced, uh, the adversity that you that you faced uh, to participate in this sport? Well, always when we participated in sports, even in high school, I mean, people would kind of laugh at us and 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 uh, and tease us that somehow. Uh, sports were silly for girls or you were tomboys or, you, you know, you, it was an alternative to being a cheerleader or, or something. But when I started running, that's when people got kind of concerned because that's when people said, well, you know, you might hurt yourself. You're never going to have children. Your uterus is definitely going to fall out. You're going to get big legs. They gave me all of these myths. But it's really funny how the body never lies. You know, the more I ran, the better I felt and the stronger I felt. And I could resist all of these kind of kind of myths. Um, I also came from a family of great uh, pioneers, you know, who who uh, were homesteaders in America. And certainly the women there <laughs> were going through incredibly arduous work and um, had plenty of kids. <laughs> so that wasn't the that certainly didn't appear to be an issue. So I ignored those myths. And, and it wasn't until I got to Syracuse University where I went to actually study journalism because I wanted to be a sports writer. I knew I wasn't going to have any sports. Wait for this. I knew I wasn't going to have any sports after high school. (laughs) (laughs) So I thought I can at least write about it. When I got to Syracuse University, it was a big powerhouse university of sports for men, um, and um, but nothing for women. So since I was emboldened by running, I went and asked the track coach if I could run on the men's team. And he said, no, it's un- you can't be uh, official because it's against NCAA rules, but we'd welcome you to come work out with the cross-country team. So I, I did. I showed up on the course, and they were wonderful to me and very, very welcoming And you know, in this amazing era of – uh, the first wave, big wave of the women's liberation movement. Um, I was nervous about it, but they were great. And um, one little guy in particular, a volunteer coach, whose name was Arnie Briggs, was very old. He was 50. <laughs> and, and he took me under his wing and, and helped me run. Nice. So, uh, yeah, so that, that, was, that was the beginning. He was an ex-marathoner. He had run the Boston Marathon 15 times and regaled me with stories of Boston and, and – uh, uh, when he said women couldn't run a marathon, and I said, are you kidding? I said, plenty of women have run marathons, or at least on the distance, including Roberta Gibb at Boston the year before. He just erupted in, in, in anger and said, no woman could possibly do it. And uh, we argued. And he didn't believe any of the stories he had heard about women running marathons and um, and, and effectively said, uh, if, if you show me in practice that you can do it, I'll take you to Boston. So that was it. You know, he challenged me. And in practice, one day we ran 31 miles. He was so convinced he became an evangelist for women's running and helped me sign up for the race. And that that was a critical point there, you know, signing up for Boston. Yeah, no, that that that's that's fantastic. I like I like how you turned him. That's fantastic. So um, yeah. now now when you did sign up for the race, uh, you went by the initials KV Switzer. 
Um, but apparently that, I mean, I just, you know, going by what, what I've read uh, through the years, but that was kind of blown out of proportion. Um, people kind of thought that maybe you were trying to sneak past them by just putting the initials there. No, I, I absolutely wasn't. I'd started signing my name KV Switzer when I was 12 because I was writing sports for my high school newspaper. And that sounded kind of cool, but also because my dad misspelled Catherine on my birth certificate. So no matter what, it was always misspelled. So I thought, well, KV is going to sort it out. And at least they can't misspell that. So I began signing, you know, like J.D. Salinger, E.E. E. Cummings or T.S. Eliot. You know, I wanted to be a cool writer. So it was KV Switzer. The, the point is this, is they obviously thought it was from a man when the entry form went in. Um, and my coach, uh, I, I didn't think I didn't needed to even register for the Boston Marathon. And again, he got really angry with me and said, come on, you're a registered member of the Athletic Federation. You've got to pay your $2 entry fee. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, you've got to <laughs> sign up for the race. You've got to get a medical exam. This is serious stuff. You don't just go and jump into Boston. And I said, well, Roberta Gibb, you know, just jumped in and didn't have a number. And he said, that's wrong. You know, you've got it. You've got to register if you're serious. I said, OK, I'm serious. Let's do it. So. You know, when I went up to Boston, I was going up to run. I was going up to run my first marathon. I was very, very proud of the fact that I knew I could do it. I'd done it in practice, in fact, five miles more than, than the marathon. I was confident about finishing the race, but like any runner, very nervous about the marathon because anything can happen. And the weather was horrific. Um, and that was another thing that played in my favor, um, it, unbeknowing to me at the time. Because it was sleeting, snowing, headwind. Honest to God, um, all of us in the race were wearing everything we owned. And we looked like refugees. <laughs> and, and there I was in my baggy gray sweats that I was going to throw away after I warmed up. <laughs> and I kept them on. And, and, of course, officials couldn't see that I was a woman. So we were wearing everything we had. And as we were warming up, um, all the men would come over to me and say, oh, it's so great to see you here. I wish my wife had run. I wish my girlfriend would run and good luck. And, But, you know, you're always still nervous about the marathon. I, I wasn't nervous about the guys. They were wonderful. I was mo mildly nervous about the officials because, um, uh, you know, it, it, this it, they just obviously weren't welcoming women particularly. But, but there was nothing on the entry form or – uh, in the rule book that said it was a men's only race. Um, I knew that probably my coach and I were pushing a point by getting the bibs, but we had the bibs. He went in and picked them up for the team and I was wearing mine. So I felt, okay, fine. You know, we're, we're okay. We're legitimate. We're doing everything right. We're following the rules. Um, and because we all looked alike as we were warming up, I'm sure the officials couldn't see that I was a woman. But, I mean, I wasn't going up to them and saying, hey, I'm here, I'm a girl. I had my head down and I was warming up like anybody else before race. I, I had a, a, a long way to be concentrating on. And as we, we got pushed into the starting area, one of the officials, in fact, checked off my number and pushed me in. And I looked at Arnie and Arnie looked at me, my coach, and I said, I guess I'm okay. And he said, I, I told you you'd be okay. You're fine. So... We didn't think anything of it. Now it was happy time. You're going to enjoy that first 10K of the race and then, you know, dig in. And a mile and a half into the race, the press truck and all the, the officials' uh, vehicles came rushing past us and then went crazy seeing me in the race wearing bib numbers and taking my picture. And they were apparently teasing the race director, Jock Semple, and he jumped off of the bus and went after me and attacked me and screamed at me, get the hell out of my race and give me those numbers and tried to pull them off of me and throw me out. And um, it was screaming at me. And I was so scared. And my coach said, leave her alone. She's OK. And then my boyfriend just decked the official, <laughs> just pow, decked him. And poor Arnie, my coach, said, run like hell. <laughs> Down the street we went. You know, I'm, I'm telling this story. Uh uh, it's funny in the retelling because the, the burly boyfriend saves the girl from the mean old man. Um, but it was very, very upsetting. And it, it was happening in front of the press truck. And people were taking my picture and yelling at me and being very aggressive. And, I mean, I was only 20. I was in my first race. And what have I done wrong? I couldn't couldn't get a, get a fix on it because all the guys were so welcoming. I didn't know what the big deal was. And, um, and then I made the important decision, which was to finish. I said, you know, Arnie, I'm going to finish this race no matter what. If I don't finish it, nobody's going to believe what, 
that women deserve to run and that that were capable of it. I have to finish the race. So I had an enormous amount of pressure on me, and it, not only in terms of um, just trying to finish a marathon, but also of of upholding, you know, that banner for women. When when you know in a marathon that anything can go wrong. I mean, you can fall down, or you can get diarrhea, or you just get the bonk and you can't finish. Whatever. I had to finish. So the pressure was was really considerable. Yeah. And I often I often look back on that moment. Um, And say, how did a 20-year-old girl have the ability to make that decision? Well, it was because, you know, I'd been running most of my life. And I felt empowered and strong and and very confident. And by the time I finished the race, I was no longer angry. Because you can't run um, 42 Ks and stay angry. And, um, And I'd forgiven the official, but I wanted to create opportunities for women. And I knew that the reason they weren't there is because they had been afraid and um, and they weren't going to try anything arduous in, until they had a good example and somebody to give them the opportunity. So I didn't know what it looked like then, but it, it gave me the career path for the rest of my life. Absolutely. And um, such a powerful story. And yeah, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, you would never expect or plan for. And it just absolutely changes things on a colossal scale and and i mean uh, you know rather than me putting words in your mouth the the photo of uh of Semple, you know grabbing you how did that photo uh change your life well it changed my life completely because um you you can't the photograph can't lie and you can see it visually happening and it is riveting to many many people um it certainly uh, made me also feel responsible you know, you can have something happen to you and you can walk away from it or you can pick it up and change your social injustice and make it right. And um, that's the decision I made is to change it. And I spent my life doing it. But how gratifying it has been now, uh, 50 years later in my own lifetime, to see more women runners than men, to see a social revolution of empowerment taking place among women, to see men and women running events together, motivating each other, um, becoming symbols, if you will, for diversity and inclusion and equality. It was really, really very, very um, momentous. And um, for me to uh, be able to to use that vehicle also to um, create a series of global races, this was my career actually for on and off for 25 years, um, with Avon Cosmetics sponsorship, I was able to create a series of global races in 27 countries, 400 events, over a million women that lobbied the International Olympic Committee um, to get the women's marathon into the Olympic Games in 1984. So that was another uh, historical game-changing moment where the world saw on television women running 42 Ks and suddenly realized women indeed could do anything. So why are we selling them so short? So that was very, very important. Now what's important, um, because I know my time is running up on this interview, um, is is what what goes next. And and while we say, okay, women now have Olympic inclusion, that that they have vast numbers in our major marathons around the world, there's still women in the world who are afraid to take the first step, uh, who who are afraid to go or are not allowed to go out the door and and, uh, experience running and, and the wonderful empowerment that it brings. So an amazing thing happened uh, only about five years ago, which was that famous bib number that Jock Semple tried to pull off of me in the race has now become this kind of magic number, meaning fearless in the face of adversity. In fact, the Boston Athletic Association has even retired that bib number, um, which which now has been changed with with me and my friends into a um, nonprofit organization called 261 Fearless. You can find out more by going to 261fearless.org. And we are taking that sense of empowerment that that number gives and creating community clubs around the world where women can come in a non-judgmental and non-competitive way and experience taking that first step in running uh, of friendship, um, of trust, and of experiencing something that empowers them. And it's really taking off. We're in nine countries already. It's a really strong, amazing organization. And particularly in Canada, we're making a big outreach uh, this year, starting with uh, a, two lectures that I'm giving. I hate to say lectures. Okay, let's say meet and greet and seminars <laughs> at the Expo at the Toronto Marathon. If you go, you can find more information on the Toronto Marathon website or also uh, on 261fearless.org. 
where we're trying to show women in Canada how they too can start clubs in their own communities and how they can take the sense of, of how much running has given them and pass it on to somebody else. Uh, the campaign is actually called Tell Her She Can, because so many women say, oh, I can't. I can't possibly do that. And it's so easy and cheap and accessible. We know you can, and we'll show you how. So I would really encourage so many women out there listening to come and join us, uh, hear more about it, uh, and and sign up, start a club, and pass on what you know to somebody else. It's great. That's so tremendous. And I mean, uh, this segues a little bit into, into my next question. I feel like this will be a difficult one to answer, because... Uh, the resume is just is just so long, but uh, what has been your proudest moment thus far? Well, I would have said up to um, uh, th- three years ago when, when I really started this foundation, I would have said getting the women's marathon into the Olympic Games. Definitely. That was such a huge global achievement. But, you know, the legacy may really be how many lives you personally touch with um with outreach. And I think it's going to be become 261 Fearless, the nonprofit, because um, and I might not see fruition of this, you know, because because it might not reach full power and capacity until after my death. Um, And I mean, I don't plan on dying anytime soon, but these things take time. I mean, it took, uh, you know, 1984 was still eight years after I ran the Boston Marathon. No, much longer than that. Sorry. Um, What, 67 (laughs) 77, 12, 14 years after I ran the Boston Marathon. So these things take time, but but they they generate very quickly um, and 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 move powerfully. So I would say that I would say probably in general, if you're saying what is the most the proudest moment uh, for me is uh, not a moment, but a sense that um, that I have and we have as women touched many women's lives personally and helped empower and made their lives more positive. I had one of the most amazing experiences uh, at the Boston Marathon in 2017, two years ago, when I ran the race again 50 years after I first did. And everybody said, wow, you're the first woman in history to run the marathon 50 years after she first did. I said, well, that's not really remarkable because plenty of 70-year-olds run. But what is remarkable is how few women ran 50 years ago to make me the first you see <laughs> that's that just shows how few women few women ran in those days but anyway i'll tell you it was the happiest day of my life because going through the streets of boston um running pretty well too um like uh, only 20 minutes slower than i ran when i was 20 <laughs> so so to have everybody cheering and knowing what 261 was all about and holding up great big signs that go 261 go for it and, and um uh, having the first woman president of the BAA, Boston Athletic Association, in 135 years, greet me at the finish line along with my husband, Roger. So it was uh, really wonderful. And 125 women running in support of 261 and raising money for the foundation, which was great and effectively globally launched us. As a surprise, it was the next day that the Boston Athletic Association had this wonderful ceremony to retire the bib number. So it, it was quite momentous. And uh, uh, I will, I'll never forget the day. It was perfect. Everything went, went unbelievably well. And um, again, considerable pressure at the start. You know, you're 70 and you're going to run a marathon again 50 years later. <laughs> anyway, it went great. You know what? I, I, I was going to sum up, but I just want to ask one more question before we get to our final uh, cliche question, if you will. But um, now you finish the race, uh, going back to 67 here, uh, you finish the race, you go on to race a number of more times in different marathons here and there. You then get into broadcasting uh, before becoming an author. Um, you know, just wondering, sometimes like, you know, a moment will happen in life and it just ha- it happens to you, so it doesn't really sink in uh, just how momentous it really was. And uh, I'm, just, I'm just curious, like, for you, Based on 1967, everything you've done since, has it sunk in still just how big of a symbol and figure you are in, in womankind, uh, especially on the sports front? Has that, has that sunk in yet? No, because I'm a very ordinary person. And basically, you know, it's not what happens to you that matters, it's what you do with it. And so once you take responsibility for it, you've got a lot of work to do. 
Um, and I'm insanely busy. And, and so I really don't have time. And besides, you know, I, I have never I have never thought I was special or, or I sit back on my laurels because, you know, I was the person who always would pick it up and say, OK, let's make it happen and lick the envelopes and write the press releases. You know, somebody's got to do it. Nobody. I'm not. I, I think you would find that people who are people of accomplishment are, are really not sitting on a throne, but basically uh, uh, <laughs> making uh, are very very busy making things happen, so I don't think it'll ever sink in. And 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 I, and, I, and in fact, uh, because it, I can tell you something else, it, it it was it was a very weird experience at the time in '67. We 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 thought that the guy, Jock, was just a crank, you know, race director who was overworked. We didn't even think it was any big deal. We just thought that that was weird. Um, and it wasn't even until midnight that we saw newspapers, and from then on it changed. But um, there was that blissful moment when we th- when it was just weird. <laughs> <laughs> but as I say, the, the the moral to this is it's not what happens to you that matters; it's what you do with it. Absolutely, that's what's important. That's that's a great call. I've I've been so excited to ask this final question of you. Um, because I mean, you're definitely one of, if not the most motivational person I would say that we've had on this show. Uh, so this is our final question. We ask all of our guests, uh, we ask, what are their rise and shine rules? My co-host, uh, who's not here today, unfortunately, but, uh, he has a rise and shine foundation that he puts on leadership camps and stuff like that. These are the rules that, that, you know, you say to yourself, they get you out of bed in the morning, how you approach each and every single day. What are your rise and shine rules? Golly. I don't really have rules. I mean, I, um, my life is so busy as more of a react, but basically the most important thing is uh, to get out of bed and get a cup of tea and get started. (laughs) (laughs) Just, just get something hot in my hand and, 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 and get started and, uh, take deep breath and say, okay, I can do it. Uh, by four or five in the afternoon, it's okay. Hit the priority points, you know, because you're never going to finish. You're never going to finish this. So um, I try to get a perspective on it. And I, I would say the, the only other hard and fast rule is, is that at some point in the day, and I, and I seem to never be able to prioritize it the way I want to, but sometime in the day, I have to get in a run or core exercise work. So definitely exercise has to be a part of every single day that 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 is a rule healthy body healthy mind i love it you bet that's Absolutely. fantastic well Catherine, thank you so much for taking the time we're so greatly appreciative you're so welcome all right as per usual we've got to talk about the sponsors the great people that make the rise possible we're going to start things out with the fine folks at botanica the new perfect protein elevated anti-inflammatory by botanica it's an organic Plant protein blended with anti-inflammatory superfoods, including turmeric and ginger, plus 20 grams of fermented plant protein packed with natural vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, healthy fats, and fiber. We love that fiber. Uh, Turmeric helps reduce inflammation, which is key for sports recovery. I've gone through a concussion. Our usual co-host, Jay Demerit, he's gone through an absolute Rolodex of injuries. Uh, Turmeric helps fight inflammation. It is great stuff. It helps get you back out there a lot quicker than you originally planned. Uh, Also, I've got to mention the fine folks at the Burrard Hotel. They bring us this. Even two guys in green spandex sometimes need to break away from regular life. And the Burrard has everything we need. Space for hanging out. Bikes for exploring. Sweet rooms for getting ready for the game. And an amazing downtown location. So So book book your Burrard Burrard breakaway now now and we'll see you at the game. game. Just a slap shot away from Rogers Arena or BC Place. You can go down, catch a Canuck game, BC Lions, Whitecaps, Vancouver Warriors, which are a great time, by the way. Uh, check in with the Burrard. They got a great setup over there. As mentioned, just footsteps away. So if you want to have a couple pops, if you want to spend the night downtown, it's a tremendous option. Some great amenities there as well. And if you're thinking about checking in, use this promo code GREENMEN. It'll save you 15% at theburrard.com when you're booking your next day. By the way, the folks at Burrard Roofing and Drainage, they bring us this. 
Drip, drip, drip. Ladies, you don't have to sleep with that drip tonight. You know, that annoying drip in your home you just haven't gotten around to getting rid of? Berard Roofing and Drainage can fix that annoying drip. For 40 years, Berard Roofing and Drainage has been fixing roof leaks right down to the cause, guaranteed. Call Berard Roofing and Drainage. Call 604-986-1812. Berard Roofing and Drainage. We've got you covered. Berard Roofing and Drainage, we absolutely love them. Rated triple A by the Better Business Bureau. Catch them at berardroofing.com or anytime at 604-986-1812. Thanks to the fine folks at Red Truck Beer for keeping us hydrated. As always, thank you so much as well to the Daily Hive for keeping the publicity going. We love you guys. You do such great work. Check them out anytime, dailyhive.com. Thank you again. Another episode of The Rise in the Books. I'm Ryan Sullivan. See you next week. <laughs>